Hello, and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join us for a visit with leaders in personal and cultural transformation. This is Donald Altman sitting in for Pathways host, Paul O'Brien. In today's world, where authority figures are routinely picked apart for their faults, finding a spiritual teacher, let alone trusting one, would seem to be a daunting task. The topic of teacher abuse is very much under discussion in many religious and spiritual communities these days, and yet the right teacher can be an important stepping stone to greater knowledge, love, wisdom, and growth. To explore the theme of finding a right spiritual teacher, it's a pleasure to have as our guest today, Frank Capetiers. Frank was born in the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. From a young age, he had a very successful academic career, which he left behind to actively pursue a spiritual search, which took him to Portland in 1985, where he's made his home ever since. He teaches Reiki and shamanic workshops around the world, often with his wife, Kathy Melcher, who was a therapist. Frank is the author of Handbook for the Evolving Heart, as well as his new book, Unity in Everything That Is. Frank is director of the Living Light Spiritual Center, which he started in Portland in 1986. Currently, he works as an intuitive counselor, as well as offering shamanic classes and sessions to help bring people into balance and access higher levels of consciousness. Well, hello, Frank, and welcome to the Pathways Show. Thank you, Donald. It's an honor to be with you. Well, it's great to have you here. and. Um, I think uh, nowadays we could all benefit from higher levels of consciousness, couldn't we? <laughs> you could <laughs> but, say you know, that, I, yes. Yeah. You know, I know spiritual teachers have played a big role in your life, and I was hoping you could share with us how you met your first spiritual teacher, uh, Jos Kasus, is that how you pronounce that? Yes, yes. It's yeah, a, and he was a visionary, a well-known visionary painter as well. But uh, tell me a little about how you met him, and how did you know he was the right teacher for you? Oh, that's actually a, a, a good question, because in the beginning, huh, so somebody mentioned to me, actually one of my students, that there was a shaman coming to the town where I was living, Antwerp in Belgium, and I was so surprised because I had no idea there were still practicing shamans in Belgium. Mm. And so, of course, I went and I must say it was almost immediate. There was a transmission of energy of sorts mm. that I had never quite experienced in, in that way. And, you know, I used to be quite shy. I would never really approach any speaker that I had gone to, but I was almost forced to do it. So I, I, I went up to him afterwards and I said, well, is it possible to, to, to be with you? Do, do you teach? Do you have sessions? Mm -hmm. And he had this very open but quite penetrating eyes. And, and he looked at me and says, yes, yes, I do. And you have to come. It was almost like an mm. order. and <laughs> Nobody had ever really. <laughs> so that... It took me by surprise, I must say, and uh, that was the beginning, actually. Yeah, so was that, when you no... say there was a transmission of energy, was it something that you felt? Was it an intuitive sense? What, what was that feeling that you felt there was this connection? Yes, yes, and it's actually somewhat hard to describe, but I, I remember that I shifted, now Now I underst understood what happened. I shifted state from a, a bit of a, a sleep state to a very awake state. Mm. And the state was also in my body. I actually had shivers running through my arms at times. Um, and there was also a kind of a vague sensation that became clear what this person is transmitting i i know this i mean i knew i didn't but there was another part of knowing that said yes you 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 know what this is so that was kind of the the remarkable transmission of um a different i think a different type of consciousness okay and then um so now you have this teacher so um when do you decide actually okay i i'm going to become a shaman <laughs> 
<laughs> and who did you probably you had not even thought that was being practiced here, and yet here you are suddenly being taught. Right, right. And 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 you know, to tell you the truth, that took a long, long time. But just before my papers were ready to immigrate to the US, out of nowhere, I had a strong, strong sense. I need to be initiated by Yoshka because I knew he did that, but you know, he was kind of quiet about that. Mm -hmm. But I called him and I told him, you know, I'm leaving. I was leaving actually eight days later. And he said, okay, that's a short time, but yes, we can do this. And so that actually happened the night before I immigrated. And it was a very powerful initiation for me. Um, and I didn't really do anything with it for a while but I had bought a little drum for the initiation, which I had taken with me on my travels to the US. And so on my own, I started, you know, banging on that drum. I started making sounds like my teacher was making them, you know. Uh -huh. And so slowly, 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 and then I would mix it. I was also becoming a massage therapist here in Portland in the Oregon School of Massage. And so I was I was giving massages to people and every so often at the at the end of a massage for some people, I would pick up a drum, my drum, some Tibetan bowls, and I would just vocalize. And some people would say, Frank, what is what is that? What is that? Could you do more? <laughs> and so, you know, no. gradually it developed. And then I was invited to to come back to Belgium at some point for a workshop, which I taught. And I don't know when when I would have actually uh, have called myself a shaman, and I'm still hesitant at times to do that, you know, except uh -huh. when people come, of course, I, I obviously step in that role. I'm happy to do it. But yeah, I think it took at least at least 15 to 20 years before I felt comfortable. Uh -huh. How interesting. Saying, yeah, I, I do yeah. shamanic work. When and, and so I was also wondering, you know, how did your family and friends react to that transformation, really? Here's a major shift in your life from doing the academic work, and now you're pursuing the spiritual work. Um, did you, what kind of reaction did you get from your family and friends in general? Well, that was quite mixed. My, my parents were concerned um, because, you know, I had certainly fulfilled fulfilled their dream of becoming, you know, an assistant professor with tenureship. And so they knew I was visiting Yoshka. Um, but once I decided to become serious about it, and then to actually become, you know, a massage therapist, a shaman, a Reiki practitioner, they, they felt they had lost the son they knew. Mm. Um, yeah, so that that took some some friends were were certainly supportive. Some colleagues also felt, hmm, you're no longer an objective scientist. Now you're actually participating in in what you are teaching about, <laughs> which I thought was a kind of a compliment, but no, it wasn't meant as such. <laughs> well, I it was like, like, yeah, I kind of like that you. Uh, even don't have the strong identification with being a shaman because that's an ego uh, identity attachment in a way, isn't it? But it's- It could different. be, it could be, yes. Yeah, and so it's different from just doing the work. And, um, you know, in your book, Unity in Everything, or that is, uh, you give us portraits of 13 teachers who have influenced you. Um, but I know that those weren't the only teachers you were influenced by. How did you make that selection? Was that difficult for you? Yes, that was interesting because I, um, I knew for a while that I had to write the book. I wanted to write it. And that I also wanted to put a bit of my experiences in it, but I wanted it more to serve the readers than it just being autobiographical. So I took a workshop for writers in Belgium. And during that, it was a short workshop. Uh, most of the people in there were actually business leaders, but during the workshop, all of a sudden, I think it was the second night, I saw that the structure of the book could be wrapped around a number of my teachers. And then I was wondering, well, how many? And the, the number 13 came. 
and then it was actually quite clear who those 13 would be and mm. they're not all my teachers um but i felt immediately very very good about it like okay now i can start and it never yeah. shifted the choice of the teachers never shifted okay you know um what i liked about your book actually was how you um really in a way kind of distilled the teachings of each one of those persons so that as a reader i got not just a sense of how you came into the orbit of that teacher and the effect it had on you but then i got an understanding of the the work itself and uh so i thought i really liked that uh, so oh, what, did, what did you know tell us a little about maybe what you received from some of the different teachers what was most important to you on your path Yes, yes. Well, you know, I start with Ramana Maharshi, um, who some of your listeners may know and some may not, but he was this unbelievably beautiful, widely acknowledged saint from, from India. And I still remember the first time I saw a picture of him and how I was moved by it. And of the many teachers, he seems to be always there for me as a very peaceful presence. And, you know, his method of teaching was mostly through silence, but also through asking this profound question, you know, what, what are you really? Who are you really? And he claimed this was very simple. Um, and I, I think it is on some level. It's certainly very direct. And whenever I feel confused or when I feel I'm a bit moved into my egoic thinking, I go back to Ramana mm -hmm. and I ask that question, you know, and I, I picture Ramana and I have many pictures of him in my home. So I go to that question, what am I really? And the moment I ask that mm -hmm. question, there is a shift. Um, where, as you said, you know, I'm not so identified with playing a role. I'm just in um, a, the presence of the light in a way, you know, mm. quite formless, but very present. So that is the big gift for yeah. from Ramana. Uh, I, I really, uh, if I'm not careful, I could cry when I talk about Ramana, <laughs> you know. Because, and, and everybody, many, many people feel that, you know, about Ramana, mm -hmm. how, how amazing, um, amazing he was. And, and of course, I've never met him. He died in 1950, um, the year I was born. But I do write in the book, you know, that uh, in a, maybe a, a flash of a past life, who knows, but knowing that Ramana came and, and was present on this planet is a great reassurance to me, even today, you know, <laughs> when things are difficult in the world, I think, well, Ramana, Ramana has been here and, and Ramana is still available, you know? Well, so yeah, that's, that's the beauty of, the, of these uh, spiritual teachers or teachings and the guides and that work is still available to us today. And it's as real today and as relevant today, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. Who who else would you point out maybe that had an impact on you? Well, certainly Osho, uh, who is a bit of a controversial figure um, for understandable reasons. But I spent two years in his physical presence. Um, and I must say that's where the grip of the old conditioning, of course, that we all carry, you know, but mm -hmm. that grip loosened for me and also the meditations that he devised were very very good meditation for these times um, especially for me the dynamic meditation which i did that when i was living in belgium actually and not in his physical presence i did that meditation i think almost every day for a year mm -hmm. and it it loosened up my my the way Eckhart Tolle talks about a pain body. So day by day, there was something of that pain body that got released. And also my voice got much stronger because you know, there's a, a mantra that's being used, a Sufi mantra. So yeah, I credit a lot of my ability to kind of renew myself 
to having been in the, in the presence with Osha, and not just him, but the people he attracted worldwide were very interesting people. They were all seekers mm -hmm. of one sort or another. And also being with, with those people who had the same deep longing that I had, you know, to, to try to wake up. Um, and he had a sense of humor, which I really appreciate, uh, still do. Um, yeah, so, so Osho definitely, uh -huh. uh, yeah, is in the top, the top five of the ones who gifted me with something really incredible. Yeah, no, I think that we, we uh, especially nowadays, need to lighten up <laughs> yes. in the world. And uh, I feel in some sense that our, our, um, it's almost like if you had a thermometer to take the, the global temperature, we have, we're running a fever. Yes. And so we uh, need, I think, to have some spiritual guidance at this time. You know, uh, one of the things that interested me was you put a lot of paintings of, uh, of your teacher, Shoska, in your book. And those are really amazing paintings. And I've, I've actually seen them at, in, your, in your house as well. Uh, could you tell us a little about that and why you included those? Yes, yes, that's, that's right. So in that workshop that I took where I saw the 13 teachers, I also realized that I wanted to pay homage to my shamanic uh, teacher. I was always surprised when I went to his home. I was so moved by his paintings. Uh, I had actually never seen anything quite like it. And he was not really, he was very prolific but he didn't sell that many paintings except to, to his students. And I know that while he was painting, he was also vocalizing. So Yoshka lived in a world of light and sound and had been living there since he was a young boy. So I started collecting his works at some point whenever and they were not that expensive to 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 pay actually they were quite reasonable and so i would bring them home i would put them in our home and i could see whenever i had a little bit of a shift in my own awareness that the paintings would speak to me even more and so he had actually said that he said you know frank if you surround yourself with pa these paintings they will have a profound effect Mm. on you and so i thought well wouldn't it be great you know to make a selection and i have a friend you know who's a great photographer put them in the book it's going to become a little bit of an expensive book you know yeah but i can also do a black and white version but especially in the in the colored version i was hoping that maybe some people would also be receiving you know yeah. the, the light in there well, they're, they're very unusual paintings in that they do seem to just be uh, draw, uh, painted with light itself as a source of light. There's only other, one other painter who I've seen work anything like that. And his name is Peter Burkhauser. He's a German artist who actually worked a lot with the unconscious mind and with Carl Jung. And he would, his paintings like Juska's are almost just all made of light. Yes. So, yeah, and, and it does have a, a very meditative effect, I found, just looking at uh, the paintings in your book. Oh, that's wonderful, because that was really the intent of that. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. You know, you immigrated, what, to the U.S. when you were 35? That's right. You're, so you're 70 now. You're, you're, <laughs> that's uh, right. You're my age, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. I'm the same age. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on your life, was that a uh, was that a decision you would have made again, to to really um, leave Sh your life? Yes, yeah. yes, I would make it again. Even though today it's not so much fun, uh, certainly politically, to uh, live here. It's a, as you said, you know, the it seems like the whole globe has fever, but certainly in this country there is a feverish state, to say the least. But I must say, I did, I did experience, um, you know, what is called the American dream. Uh, so I started a little bit with a blank slate here, you know, worked in a restaurant and did all the things that one does when one comes here. 
And I must say, the people that I met here in Oregon, I find them very open, very open to Reiki, very open to shamanic, very open to yeah. me also. Of course, you know, I have the right skin color, so that may have something to do with it. And I'm um, basically a, a happy fellow. But really, I needed the encouragement of this culture to find myself. Mm. Um, I had opportunity after opportunity, and I learned from, from, from many people. And I think also the native traditions, that was a, a big draw yeah. for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. And your approach really does seem very ec eclectic. There's shamanism, mm -hmm. there's Reiki, Tibetan Buddhism, and they'll use the singing bowls, uh, Eckhart Tolle and Osho, of course, and even A Course in Miracles. So I'm wondering, at, with having so many different uh, influences on your journey, has that ever been confusing to you at all? Or how would you, would you recommend that people experience more than one path? Well, I, I think for some people it can be an advantage. Certainly today, you know, which is a day where many traditions are seeing that in essence, um, they come from maybe one revelation, one could say. Of course, for some people, it could be too much, you know, so maybe one or two mm -hmm. or three. But uh, there are many what they call Jubus today, right? Jewish people who follow the, the Buddhist traditions and right. sometimes vice versa, I guess. Um, a few times it has been confusing to me thinking that I should only have one teacher, but most of the time, and certainly now, I, I love this abundance, you know, I just love it. Yeah. I really do. It is an abundance, isn't it? It's a nice way of putting it. Yes, yes. And you know, and of course it's, it's nice to have, like in my case, that I could go to Yoshka that he knew me, that he could follow my path. That was a great privilege. But it's also wonderful, you know, to think of Ramana and immediately feel Ramana, whom I have never met, right? Yeah. So why would I ever exclude somebody like Ramana or somebody like the Buddha or Jesus, right. you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I was going to ask you, I wanted to, to ask you about the... Uh, Inspired guidances, which is what you call them, and they're through, written uh, throughout your book, actually. Um, and uh, can you explain a little bit about inspired guidances and how did this originally occur to you or to you? Yes, yes. Well, there was, I describe it in my book, uh, there was a remarkable session I had in London with a medium. And the story is too long, but there were synchronistic circumstances that led me to her and a number of out-of-body experiences that I was experiencing at the time. And during that um, session, she was channeling a, a guide herself or a master. And at some point, I was being asked if I would be willing to bring through some teachings from an ascended master. And you know, I, I felt the seriousness of that question and I ended up almost immediately saying yes to that. Mm. But then later I thought, my God, you know, I promised you something. And then I started practicing uh, with the help of some people to allow some words of wisdom to come through mm. and it took a long time before before that really was solid and then i started doing it in the workshops i teach and it i found out that was a wonderful basis for those workshops and then it became like a daily almost daily practice of mine yeah um, i i love doing it you know i was wondering if you maybe could read us a couple of the inspired guidances that um you know, you might feel are particularly relevant to our current situation. Sure, I could. I could. Um, let's see. Actually, I could read. I had one come through this morning, so maybe that would be interesting. Oh, great, yeah. In the absolute, 
there are no disturbances in the in-between realms there are fluctuations in the light realms in between there is rich information and plenty of inspiration from these realms of light the masters of wisdom are now gathering around you they come from various traditions they always have good advice for you during meditation you offer yourself to truth and you offer yourself to eternity give this now a sincere try you're bowing to truth and you're bowing to eternity as you bow you may experience infinity even a short glimpse of infinity is extremely valuable maybe you can hear the soundless sound beyond all sounds at the same time you no longer see yourself as a limited being you are conscious of being a connected totality you're learning to listen to the unknown in yourself you are exploring in the depth of your being that you already are what you seek you are opening to the divine opening to infinity beyond time and space you are present you are awakened to what you really are you are awakened to the love you are if you are in need of a recharge the masters of wisdom are always there to help you they channel their energy and their advice through your inner teacher when you are fed up with your own ignorance or the widespread ignorance in the world you can always go directly to the absolute to recharge your batteries wow well thank you frank that was beautiful i love the sense of of uh, surrender and offering that was present in that um well, you know, I'd love to talk longer, and I know there's a lot more we could explore, explore but we've uh, run out of time today. But I want to be sure to tell your, our listeners about your website, which is livinglightcenter.com. That's livinglightcenter.com, which is where you can find Frank's books and audiobooks. Uh, on his website, you can listen to his most recent podcasts, and his books are also uh, available at Amazon. For those who tuned into the Pathway Show late, this is your host, Donald Altman, author of several books on mindfulness, including my newest, Simply Mindful, a seven-week course and personal handbook for mindful living. Information about my courses and books and CDs can be found at mindfulpractices.com. In a second, I'll tell you how you can rewind and replay this interview whenever you want, via the internet or as a free podcast. Today, we've been visiting with Frank Capetiers, author of Unity in Everything That Is. I want to say thank you to all our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed KBOO FM every other Sunday morning at USA Pacific Time. Podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com. That's spelled D-I-V-I nation.com. This is Donald Altman reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. Again, thanks to Frank Capetiers and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation. <laughs>